Hello again everybody, Joe with Fly Simware Simulation Software here once again at my fly-in home, Spruce Creek, Florida. Really excited today to show you the finished Mitsubishi MU2B-60 marquee we have for you. It's been a long road of continuous uh, design over the last uh, about six months of non-stop six and seven day a week work on uh, my part and Mark's part to really get this airplane uh, out into the market for you guys to enjoy and make sure that we get you an accurate product systems uh, visuals everything as you can expect uh, from the 441 conquest that we released uh, last fall so this is going to be the same uh, regimen as the conquest walkthrough videos uh, there are going to be a couple of more videos I know that you guys were disappointed that we didn't get all the videos done for the conquest I'm sorry but rest assured there are all the videos for the MU2 um, so this is going to be the same intro video walk you around the airplane show you the features things like that um, it's going to be shorter, but we have more to cover. Uh, there's a little bit more to understand with an MU-2 than there is with a Conquest. So I'm going to walk you through um, the features of the MU-2, not just our MU-2, but the real MU-2, and what makes the MU-2 unique, and hopefully um, dispel some of the rumors that you may have heard about the MU-2 being an uh, unforgiving airplane or a pilot killer. Um, and uh, this, the MU-2 has a, some, somewhat of an undeserved rap, but we're going to go feature by feature and cover some things and sort of dispel that. So, let's take a walk over uh, to the MU-2. Walk around uh, my side yard here. Over to the hangar, which you guys are familiar with. Here is the little ramp area. Heads out to the taxiway here, as you are familiar with. And let's take a look at the Mitsubishi. So, there she is. Again, this is the MU-2B-60. <clears throat> there were many variations of the MU-2 produced over its 20-21 year production run. Uh, there was a short body aircraft and a long body aircraft. The marquee is the uh, the last built of the long body aircraft, uh, which is the MU-2B-60. And uh, similar is the MU-2B-40, which is the solitaire, which is the last built of the short built uh, short body aircraft. The aircraft that came before that were letter designated, so it was the MU-2J, uh, the MU-2K, the M, the L, uh, and there were many different variations of both the long and the short body, but the Marquis and the Solitaire are the last built, latest and greatest uh, of the long and short body aircraft, respectively. So, from a basic standpoint, uh, we can see here the MU-2 is a uh, all-metal, high-wing, all-weather uh, twin turboprop aircraft powered by the same Garrett TPE-331 engines that you're familiar with from the Conquest. The uh, MU-2, uh, the Marquis specifically, is powered by the TPE-331-10 511M model engine. Uh, the Dash 10 engines were an upgrade on the Conquest 2, whereas the Dash 10 engines were standard on the Marquis and Solitaire aircraft. Um, many of the earlier MU-2 aircraft both long and short body have been converted to Dash 10 engines, but the Solitaire and the Marquis were the only two MU-2s ever to roll off the assembly line with Dash 10 engines as standard equipment. And they offer the same performance advantages that uh, the Dash 10 engines would on any other Garrett-powered aircraft um, in their capability to maintain a ha maximum power, its maximum flat-rated horsepower of 715 shaft horsepower per side to a higher altitude. So, let's go over some of the uh, design features of the Mitsubishi MU-2 uh, and uh, cover a little bit of the negative stigma it has out there in terms of its negative reputation. We'll go over some of the design features and uh, hopefully you'll learn a little something about the airplane. Again, the, uh, only, the only thing that the MU-2 doesn't have going for it is that it's very misunderstood uh, and that any, anybody that really understands the airplane understands what it was built to do and what it really does versus what uh, what you'll hear people up at the airport talking about what it does uh, understands that it's an absolutely fantastic airplane and there's simply nothing else out there in its class uh, that does what the MU-2 does for the uh, kind of money that the MU-2 will do it for. So we'll take a walk over here and uh, we'll start going through some of the design features. One interesting thing worth mentioning is that the MU-2 was really the first turboprop airplane uh, that was really designed to actually be a turboprop airplane. And what I mean by that is, if you look at uh, the King Air 200, or, or even the King Air 90, which was the first King Air, uh, the King Air was a development on a piston-powered airplane, which was the Queen Air. Um, same thing with the Piper Cheyenne series airplane. That was developed off the Navajo airframe. 
Um, the turbo commanders are all developed off the earlier piston-powered commanders. Uh, so on, and so even the even the, the Cessna Conquest, the 441, was developed off of the 404, and the 425 Conquest 1 was developed off the 421. Uh, the MU-2 was really the first turboprop out there that was designed from the ground up to be a turboprop. Uh, and that and, and it performs as if it were designed to do it. So the design philosophy from the get-go was to build a turboprop airplane that was capable of very high cruise speeds uh, with a very smooth ride that could still get into uh, short, unimproved runways. That was the design philosophy. They wanted something that could go real fast, carry people over a long distance, and still get into uh, short and sometimes unimproved runways. That was the entire philosophy from the start. So Mitsubishi elected to do a couple of design options from the ground up. The first was a high-wing aircraft with the engines mounted under wing. Keeps the engines away from... Uh, Away from the ground gives you much better prop clearance, especially when you're landing on uh, unimproved runways. Gravel, grass keeps the intakes up higher away from there. Uh, so that was design feature number one. The second was the landing gear. And if you look at the landing gear on any MU-2, the landing gear is just built... The, the whole the whole MU-2 is built like a tank, but the landing gear specifically is extremely robust. Very, very well-built landing gear. Very, very rugged, very durable. The next thing you'll notice about the airplane is that it has a... Uh, I wouldn't say relatively. I'd say a very short wing. Uh, the fuselage and the wing on the uh, on the longer body airplanes are actually almost perfectly dimensional. Uh, the they're within inches of each other. The wingspan and the fuselage lengths are are both 39 feet. Um, the uh, there there is a difference of three inches between the length of the fuselage and the length of the wing. So the length of the wing is only about. Uh, a foot and a half to, well, the, the whole wingspan is only three feet longer than a Cessna 172. Uh, so it's a very, very short wing. Now, a shorter wing means a higher wing loading. Now, by wing loading, if you don't understand what I mean by that, the simplest way to explain that is, because there is less overall wing area, less square footage of wing, so less real estate on the wing, so to speak, uh, the wing has to uh, work harder, or, or, or better yet, um, the wing, the, the, the smaller surface area of the wing has to hold up more weight. So if we put a bigger wing on the airplane, there would be less loading in terms of pounds per square foot uh, on a larger wing than on a smaller one. So the smaller wing has to hold up more, and therefore the wing is more highly loaded. That, that's what we mean by wing loading. Now, <clears throat> the MU-2, uh, the marquee at maximum takeoff weight, weighs 11,575 pounds. So for almost a 12,000-pound airplane to have a wing that's practically uh, just, a, just a little bit bigger than that of a Cessna 172, the airplane's naturally going to have a very high wing loading. And it has a wing loading uh, similar to a Learjet, uh, which is probably part of the reason that many people would describe to you that an MU-2 flies more like a jet than it does like a turboprop. So it has a very, very high wing loading with the flaps retracted. Now, this is great for high-speed crews, um, which is hence the reason why jets all have high wing loadings. It's very good for high-speed crews. It optimized high-speed wing. Uh, but it's not very good for low-speed handling and low-speed performance. So this creates a little bit of a design dilemma, and that is how do we maintain this high wing loading, which gives us a fantastic ride in turbulence. The MU-2 rides in turbulence much better than a, a King Air, a Conquest, or anything else out there in its class. It gives us a great ride in turbulence, gives us the great high-performance cruise speeds that we're looking for. But how do we optimize the wing now for low-speed flight? So the design engineers at Mitsubishi elected to use a full-span slotted Fowler flap system, uh, similar to what you'd find on uh, on an airliner. And the flaps begin right here, and they run the entire length of the wing right to the inboard here by the wing root. So we have full span slotted Fowler flaps. And when they're fully extended, they actually increase the wing area by about 25%, and they give us those low approach speeds that we like, right around uh, 100 to 110 knots, depending on which flap setting you're using for landing. Most uh, most landings in the MU-2 are performed at uh, flaps 20. The MU-2 has four flap settings, up 5 degrees, 20 degrees, and 40 degrees. Uh, 40 degrees is kind of reserved as the, the short field landing uh, flap configuration. Uh, most landings in the MU-2 are performed at 20 degrees. Um, most takeoffs in the MU-2 are also done at 20 degrees. Uh, and under certain circumstances, takeoffs are done at 5 degrees. 
Um, but you never uh, do a takeoff in the MU-2 at flaps zero. There is no such thing as a no-flap takeoff in the MU-2, so it's either 5 or 20, and 90% uh, of your takeoffs in the MU-2 are done at 20 degrees. So now we have this giant wing, this giant flap here. So we have a wing that's optimized for both the high speed and the low speed scenarios that we like. So this leaves us with two more issues. And number one is, uh, where are we going to put the fuel since we've put all this flap in this wing? And how are we going to turn the airplane without ailerons? So the fuel situation was solved through tip tanks. And the airplane does actually have wing tanks. There are small wing tanks that are 35 gallons a side in the, in the wing itself. Uh, but then we have uh, these large tip tanks out here, 93 gallons a side, 90 gallons usable. So between the two tip tanks, you've got 180 gallons of usable fuel. A lot of gas carried out here in the wingtips. And uh, the airplane also has a uh, large center main tank in the very center of the wing. Uh, so that solves the fuel issue. And to solve the turning issue, and this is quite possibly the most misunderstood feature of the airplane uh, that has led to a lot of rumors and misunderstanding, are the... Uh, the flight spoilers. So because we have no room left in the wing for ailerons, uh, Mitsubishi elected to use spoilers for roll control. Um, proven technology. And in fact, uh, if you ask you know, somebody, hey, name me an airplane that uses nothing but spoilers to turn, everybody's first reaction is to jump on the MU-2. Uh, and because they don't understand the, the design or the, the system, the technology, uh, people kind of tend to uh, dislike or stray away from things that they don't fully understand. Uh, but what people don't realize is that there's actually many airplanes out there that use this exact same system, and it's never really been uh, a big deal, so to speak. Uh, one, and in fact, one of them uh, was flying in World War II uh, very successfully for you know years before the MU-2 ever came to be, and that was the P-61 Black Widow. Also had no ailerons, just used spoilers for roll control. And it was a fantastic airplane. Uh, another one is the Beach Jet 400. The Beach Jet 400 has no ailerons, it just has spoilers. And uh, fun fact of the day, Mitsubishi actually designed the Beach Jet. The Beach Jet 400, which is now the Hawker 400, um, was originally called the Diamond, uh, the Mitsubishi Diamond Jet. And Mitsubishi sold that design to Beechcraft, and uh, when it became Raytheon, they rebranded it as the Hawker 400. Uh, so the technology is proven, and it does work. In fact, uh, one might argue that it works better than ailerons do, and there's a number of reasons for that, but first I'll just I'll show you the flight spoilers, so we'll kind of hop up here a little bit. So I'll roll in uh, some left yoke, and you can see the flight spoilers come up here, and we'll go up, we'll do a tail view up here, kind of get up towards the ceiling, and you'll see that when we roll the yoke to the left, we get left flight spoiler, we roll it to the right, we get right flight spoiler. And full deflection is right about here, and full deflection is right about there. When you're maneuvering the airplane as you're flying along, the deflection is only about here. Very small deflection, just like that. So very, very cool, very unique uh, technology. But they have been the source of some negative rumors about the MU-2, so let's talk about that for a minute. Um, there's any number of different things that you'll hear out there or read online about why the MU-2 is dangerous and how it's an unsafe airplane, uh, and specifically how the, the spoiler for roll control system is, uh, is just unsafe, and it leads to odd or unusual flying characteristics. And the simplest way to explain that is that it's simply not true. Uh, the MU-2 rolls just like any other airplane rolls. Um, I know that there's some rumors out there that the MU-2 rolls about a wingtip instead of rolling along the axis like it should. Completely untrue. Um, there are some people that believe that because you're deploying a spoiler and you're degrading the lift on one wing, uh, that that wing drops instead of the airplane rolling one wing up, one wing down, that that wing just drops, and that's how the airplane turns. Uh, and this, this goes against every aerodynamic principle that uh, we've ever understood, and uh, the laws of aerodynamics simply don't support it, and it's, uh, it's not true. Uh, you're you're, redu you're very ever so slightly reducing the lift efficiency of the wing that you're raising the spoiler on. So by reducing the lift efficiency of that wing and maintaining the lift efficiency of the other one, um, you're going to get a one-wing lowering and one-wing raising, and the airplane rolls exactly the way any other airplane rolls. Um, another uh, adva an advantage now to the, the flight spoilers, or a two-in-one, we'll do two here, um, is that, number one, uh, they virtually eliminate adverse yaw. Um, they're really, the MU-2 really doesn't have the adverse yaw uh, characteristic you'd find in a conventional airplane with ailerons. Uh, and raising a spoiler has a very similar to effect to raising the tr uh, the trailing edge of an aileron. When you you know roll the aileron to the left and the left aileron comes up, the flight spoiler has a very similar effect. It works a little differently, but it has a very similar effect. 
Uh, another rumor is that they destroy the lift on the wing, and that by raising a spoiler, you know, uh, you're 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 getting rid of all this lift, and it's and, and by destroying all this lift, it's it it makes it unsafe. And the the fact of the matter is that the spoiler, like I just said, when you roll the airplane, uh, the deflection angle in flight is very very low. Uh, they're a very very small spoiler, and uh, they they're, they're really not destroying lift as much as they are simply reducing the lift efficiency. Um, and again, the design has been proven to be a safe, reliable, and in some situations, uh, even a more effective design than ailerons time after time after time. Uh, another advantage that you have with flight spoilers that you don't have with ailerons is that, as most of us know, uh, the slower the airplane gets, the less effective ailerons become. And if you fly around at, uh, you know, you do some minimum controllable airspeed demonstration, you fly around in a conventional airplane, uh, the ailerons get incredibly mushy to the point where they're barely even effective. Uh, because you have you have airflow separation uh, back towards the aileron, and the ailerons lose their lose their effectiveness. Uh, that doesn't happen with flight spoilers. Flight spoilers uh, maintain their effectiveness throughout all areas of the the, the flight envelope, uh, so they remain uh, very effective at low air speeds, much more effective than conventional ailerons would, which leads to much better low speed handling ability. Uh, one characteristic that they do uh, that the flight spoilers do result in which I guess you could say is unconventional, but by no means a problem, and uh, most MU-2 uh, pilots say that, you know, after the first 10 minutes of flying the airplane, you don't even notice it. Uh, the the uh, control deflections are a little bit higher, so when you want to roll the airplane, uh, you know, we're, we're all used to the whole philosophy of, uh, you know, less is more in terms of control inputs. You need very, very fine control inputs, uh, and that's still true of the MU-2, but the, the flight spoilers do require uh, somewhat larger uh, control deflections uh, to generate roll. But that's nothing out of the ordinary and uh, is not a problem or an issue or doesn't result in the airplane handling, flying, or being any less safe than any other airplane out there. Uh, another myth with the MU-2 is that uh, <clears throat> it is a, uh, the, I guess the word that most people use is a handful um, on one engine. And the event of an engine failure that the airplane can sometimes be uh, completely uncontrollable and or that it has this uh, this evil unknown corner of the flight envelope, uh, where if the conditions are just right, that you lose the engine, the airplane becomes completely, it, 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 you can't control the airplane. And again, that's entirely untrue. Um, the MU-2 is perfectly manageable on one engine. Uh, the MU-2, however, saying that the airplane needs to be flown like a jet, uh, that's not by any means an inaccurate statement. And uh, what people mean when they say that is that flying a jet uh, demands constantly, and any good pilot always should be, but demands constantly that you stay a few steps ahead of the airplane. Uh, and that for an, a given issue, you follow a specific procedure uh, all the time, every time. And the MU-2 uh, has uh, one engine and operative procedures, has specific procedures to follow for, uh, for uh, engine failures on departure. And if you follow the procedure, which is not incredibly unconventional by any stretch, uh, and by no means difficult, uh, the airplane flies just fine on one engine. Um, there are a couple of things that, that make it a little different <coughs> from, say, how you'd handle a King Air or a Baron or a 400 series Cessna, uh, or any of its other uh, other similar aircraft on one engine, uh, but by, but they're they're more similar to jet operating procedures. And uh, one example of that, not to get too in depth, is uh, what you do with the flaps if you lose an engine on takeoff. Uh, you know, most pilots that are learning to fly piston twins are taught that you know you lose an engine on takeoff. Uh, you know, your your memory item should be you know get the gear up, get the flaps up. Uh, you know, forward, 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 throttle prop mixture, everything forward, and um, the MU-2 is a little different in that sense in that the it, the flap configuration, if you lose an engine on takeoff, is more similar to a jet. And jet operators are used to the philosophy that if you lose the engine on takeoff, you don't touch the flaps. You leave the flaps alone. And that is exactly what you do in the MU-2. Because our, our flaps are so large, and they, they, they so, so incredibly increase the lift efficiency of the wing by increasing the wing area, that we want that extra lift. So if we lose an engine on takeoff in the MU-2, we leave the flaps alone. We get the gear up, we still make sure we have power coming from the good engine, uh, and, we, and you fly the airplane according to the procedure, and it's a perfectly manageable event. So without getting too much more in-depth, I do want to show you our airplane. There's plenty of reading you can do out there uh, about the MU-2 on the Internet. And, you know, if, you, if you're really the kind of guy like me where you like to know everything about your machine, um, go, do the, go do your homework. Go learn about the airplane. And um, talk to the people that actually fly the airplane. Uh, you you really you know wouldn't find anybody up at the airport if you went up and asked them oh what do you think of flying a King Air 200 and if they've never flown a King Air 200 uh, they probably won't have too much to say about it because they ha they have no experience 
Whereas with an MU2, if you ask anybody about an MU2, the first thing that comes out of their mouth if they've no, if they're not familiar with their airplane is usually something negative. And again, that comes from a, a total lack of understanding of the airplane. And uh, those that own this airplane, those that fly this airplane, and the MU2 is a little interesting because most of the MU2s out there are owner-flown airplanes. Um, the people that understand this airplane, that own them and fly them, absolutely love the airplane. And there's simply no other airplane out there that will do what this airplane does, um, for, especially at the price point. Um, you can pick up a, uh, a very nice marquee for well well under a million dollars, uh, probably in the in the six to seven fifty range, and uh, it will do every the it it will outperform its biggest competitor, which is a King Air B two hundred. It'll outperform a B two hundred. Uh, in every aspect, with the exception of maybe range, um, but uh, otherwise, the airplane has a bigger cabin than a King Air 200. It goes faster, uh, more comfortable. It's quieter, uh, and it's just a, it's a fantastic all-around airplane. So, if you really want to get to know the airplane, uh, do your homework, read up on it, and most importantly, read what the guys that actually fly the airplane have to say about it. Because um, there's plenty of people out there that are very quick to jump the gun with the MU2 that don't understand it. So, if you really want to get an understanding. You know, go on the forums and and talk to people that really know the airplane, and and they'll they'll tell you exactly what I am telling you right now, which is it's a it's a fantastic machine. Uh, it does require the the pilot to be properly trained and understand the aircraft, uh, but in the hands of in the hands of a well trained pilot, it's a phenomenal machine. That there's nothing else out there like it. So without further ado, let's take a look at the Fly Somewhere MU2. Not to go any any further on the myths and the rumors. Um, so this uh, is the Fly Somewhere MU2. Uh, six to seven months of production time, but we are finally here for you. And uh, obviously, the release of this video, the product is now on the market. You can go pick it up at uh, any of the major stores or our store at uh, the Fly Somewhere website. So I'll show you just a quick walk around here. Sitting in the hangar right now, we have no pilots. The wheels are chocked. Just give you a quick walk around view here. So the first thing I'll show you is the Fly Somewhere control panel, so you know how to control the animations. This is pretty typical of what you know most uh, developers are doing these days for a control panel. So you uh, Shift 2 command brings up our control panel, and from here you have a bunch of options for animations. So clicking on the chocks here, as you can see, places and removes the chocks. Um, the sunshades, just like we implemented with the 441, you can click those, and that puts the sh sunshades, the glare shields, and the windows. And then this thing right here says engine plugs. We'll put your uh, inlet and exhaust covers and your pitot tube covers on. And we'll go ahead and we'll take a look now. So as you can see, now we're all set up for a nice overnight stay out on the ramp somewhere. We've got our uh, sunshades, our pitot tube covers, our inlet covers, our exhaust covers. Everything is in place. So this is a good configuration if you need to leave the airplane outside overnight. And we can go ahead and come back here and remove the engine plugs, the glare shields, get all that stuff pulled out. So I'll take you inside now and uh, I'll show you the uh, interior. Uh, obviously on the exterior, you can expect all the same eye candy and details we had for you on the 441. So you can see the you know first stage compressor turbine up there in the inlet. Of course that is animated. And you can see the uh, another turbine wheel back here in the engine exhaust. Of course, that is animated as well. So uh, let's take a walk into the cabin, and I'll show you the interior. So now here we are in the cabin of the MU-2. And again, as I mentioned before, one of the biggest advantages to the, uh, specifically the long-body airplanes, the, uh, like the Marquis, is the cabin. The MU-2 has an amazing, just a fantastic cabin. Um, much bigger, well, not much bigger, but but dimensionally speaking, it is uh, a, f a little bit bigger than the cabin in a B-200 uh, in an airframe that's quite a bit smaller. Uh, so the airplane does have a very spacious and roomy cabin. Uh, we have our uh, baggage area back here with our cargo net, and uh, back here you also have working cabin light switches, so when you come in the airplane at night, you can use these here uh, to turn on the cabin lights. Uh, potty seat here. Uh, the footwork and cabin divider, if you want to close off the uh, belted potty, you can do that. Now the uh, area back here is completely separate. Now we'll close that, and you can put that little strap back in place there. The mouse is a little sensitive. There we go. So moving up, we have a four-place club. This represents a very typical MU2 uh, seating configuration here four-place club with a belted potty, and there's a two-place divan, which is a fancy word for a little couch, uh, up there in front. We'll make our way up there. 
Uh, the tables are animated, so to get those out, we have to click on this cover. That cover just gets removed. You'd stash that away somewhere. You open the top little piece here, and you click on the table. The table will slide up, come on down, and the wing comes out there. And then you can just close this little door and click on the side here to place that cover back in place. Moving forward, we have our two-place dive van, as you can see. And uh, also a very large refreshment center, a substantially larger refreshment center than we had in the 441. Uh, this nice little area here in between the uh, refreshment center and this uh, right side aft-facing seat is a great sp uh, great spot to put a couple of bags or something that's coming with you. I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of airplanes. The flight crew will uh, put their 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 bags there. Um, you know their their flight cases and their little little rollaway bags for their overnight stays. Uh, so that's a great little spot to stash stuff. And we'll go ahead and move up into the uh, cockpit again. Cockpit door, same as the uh, divider in the back. You just undo this little strap and you click on the door, and that will slide across and uh, close up the door. And we can put that strap back in place. A uh, little cabin information system here. Fully functional as long as the avionics bus has power. Uh, it shows you passengers' true airspeed, miles per hour, altitude, temperature, and uh, the current time. Moving up into the cockpit, um, there are three avionics layouts that we've given you in the uh, Conquest. And they are the same layouts that you have in your 441 if you own that as well. Uh, which is, um, the first layout is just our... Uh, our uh, Fly Somewhere GNS 530 with an audio panel. Um, and the second layout is the Flight One GTN 750. And the third layout is the Flight One GTN 750 and the Reality XP WX500 color radar. Um, in any airplane like this, in real life, you would uh, there's the, you, it's impossible to use an airplane like this to its full potential without a tactical weather radar on board. Uh, and uh, so many developers overlook this. And uh, the, the WX500 from Reality XP, even though it's been out for years, uh, is really the best or closest simulation of a weather radar we have available in the uh, flight sim world. So we decided to, just like with the 441, uh, have integration option for it if you want. Um, I like to use it. I think it actually works pretty well. And it just adds a sense of realism, because you'd never blast off on an IFR day in an airplane like this without a functioning weather radar. So, moving forward into the cockpit... This is a fairly typical uh, MU-2 cockpit layout, or a fairly typical Marquis or Solitaire cockpit layout. Uh, the cockpit of the Solitaire and the Marquis are identical. Um, long body, short body, uh, from the factory, they were virtually identical. Uh, right down to avionics, um, it's, it's the same exact cockpit. Um, so this represents a fairly typical MU-2 cockpit layout for the time. Um, we also have the overhead panel. Let me make sure I show that to you. This is where all your lighting, your de-ice, all, all the switches for that stuff are all up on the overhead panel. So I'll go ahead and slide over here into the pilot seat, and we'll do a quick cockpit walkthrough. Okay, so quick cockpit walkthrough. Don't want to get in too much detail because I'm trying to keep the video short. <coughs> so we do have uh, pilot's primary flight instruments here. This is a uh, Sperry AD500 attitude indicator. And uh, also a 500 series or 550 series uh, HSI. Uh, the airplane had Sperry avionics and a Sperry uh, autopilot from the factory. So we do have Sperry primary flight instruments over here, uh, as well as a Sperry uh, drum pointer altimeter and uh, Collins digital radar altimeter, similar to the one on the 441. Uh, this airplane also has a few uh, tasteful aftermarket modifications that we uh, that we have uh, implemented. Uh, this is a InSight TAS-1000 down here. We'll show you true airspeed, ground speed, OAT, a few other things. And that's tied, uh, it's made by the InSight company, and that's also tied to the Windicator up here, which is a very neat little instrument. Uh, some pilots think they're a gimmick. Other pilots really like them. Uh, we decided to include it. And that will show you uh, wind, wind velocity, wind direction, and correction angle on a quick display there, so you can just glance at it and immediately get wind direction, wind speed. Uh, without having to do any math or find the page on the GPS. That just kind of gives you an instantaneous display. Uh, airspeed indicator, dual needle RMI, uh, ver vertical speed indicator, that's all fairly standard. Um, the Garmin remote control unit, and um, that is a Sperry DME down there below the TAS-1000. Our Garmin uh, GTX series transponder that you're familiar with. Down here on the bottom left is the uh, electrical panel. 
So you have your uh, left and right DC generators, the AC inverter switch, and the master battery key. Um, d not to be confused with this red guarded switch over here that says master. That's not the master switch or the battery switch. Uh, the battery master, as you're used to, is actually this key here. Um, the master switch is for a ground power unit, which we will be implementing in uh, a service release, which will also be sort of an add-on package. Uh, it's going to be the MU2 total ownership experience, so to speak, uh, which will feature a, uh, a GPU feature, uh, maintenance tracking with inspection intervals and all that stuff. That will be released a little bit later. Uh, moving down, you have your enunciator panel down there. That is the main enunciator panel. Uh, the two big yellow guarded switches there are the avionics bus switches, and then as we move back, we have all circuit breaker panels and things like that. Uh, down here below the yoke, I'll go ahead and hide the yoke, and uh, you can do that by touching this little uh, wheel, this little wheel switch here, this knob on the yoke, which would normally be for a map light that's actually under the yoke, so if you have a chart on your knee or something like that, you can turn that light on. It's under the yoke, shines down. So we'll click that, and that brings up the return yoke flag, which you can click to bring it back. So down here, uh, we have a couple more switches and uh, a couple of things. The outside air temperature gauge down here. Uh, our battery, battery isolate switches to isolate the individual batteries if you want to. A uh, very important panel here, this is the fuel control panel. And the fuel control panel has four switches. Uh, left and right main fuel valves, uh, which are normally left open. <coughs> They're only used if you need to uh, absolutely secure fuel uh, completely to an engine. Uh, and they're really only closed in the event of an emergency, so they stay open all the time. But moving that switch will actuate an electrical valve that will completely isolate fuel to the engine. Uh, and then very important below them are the fuel transfer switches. Uh, like I described before, the MU-2 has five fuel tanks, two tip tanks, two wing tanks, and a big center main tank. Uh, the engines only burn out of the center main tank. So as the fuel burns out of the center main tank, the center main tank refills from the wing tanks, and the wing tanks refill from the tip tanks. So when you look on your fuel gauges, you'll see the tip tanks draining first because the fuel is moving inboard. Then you'll see the outer tanks draining, and then you'll see the main tank start to drain when it can no longer be backfilled by the outer tanks or the tip tanks. If you do not place the switches in the auto position, you will get no fuel transfer, and you'll be burning only out of the main tank. Uh, so those switches, as part of the immediately after start checklist, uh, get moved up to the auto position, and they basically live in auto all the time. Just to the right of that, we have our uh, landing gear switch and our three green lights and our red on safe light. That's fairly typical. Um, the gear cycle sequence is actually going to be a little different in this airplane. The unsafe light comes on any time um, that a... Uh, the unsafe light, when you retract and extend the gear, comes on any time that the uh, gear doors open. Uh, the green lights, of course, as they're supposed to, uh, the green lights come on uh, when the gear is positively down and locked. So when you cycle the gear switch up, you'll actually get a red on safe light um, f that'll come on for a second or two before the green lights go out. And that's because the gear doors open, which causes the unsafe light to come on. And uh, once the gear doors are open, then the gear starts to cycle and the green lights go out. Um, same thing coming down, but in the reverse order. You'll get the three green lights will come on, but the unsafe light stays on for a couple seconds uh, until the gear doors are completely shut. Uh, so uh, if you see that, that's not a glitch or a bug. That's actually the proper gear sequence. So we'll go top down now. A uh, fairly typical engine instrument layout, similar to the 441. We have our torque meters on top. Uh, they're a little different than the Conquest, only because they're measured in percent in this airplane and not foot-pounds. Uh, EGT gauges moving down. Uh, these are our uh, fuel flow gauges, engine RPM gauges, and percent RPM, just like the Conquest. Below that, we have the oil temp gauges. And then moving across the bottom here, on the bottom left is our oil pressure. Just to the right of that is the fuel pressure. And then we have our three fuel gauges, fuel quantity in the main tank, fuel quantity in the outer tanks, and fuel quantity in the tip tanks. The uh, fuel quantity in the outer and the tip tanks, you're only going to get an indication on those gauges uh, when the uh, battery uh, bus is energized. So anytime the battery switches on, you'll get an indication there. And uh, the main fuel quantity gauge is actually run on AC power. So if the inverter is not on, the gauge needle will indicate whatever the, it was saying when you turned off the inverter. So if it said 800 pounds when the inverter was turned off and you've since added fuel to the airplane, it will stay at 800 pounds until you turn the inverter on. 
on it gets power, and then it can indicate again. So that needle basically freezes wherever it was when you when it lost power. A um, whole bunch of mini toggle switches up here above that. Uh, these ones on the uh, far left are the delta P over P test switches. Uh, we have implemented the delta P over P test, and I'll show you how to do that uh, once we uh, have an engine running. Uh, outer pump mode switch is uh, the or the outer pump manual switch rather uh, for the outer fuel pumps. The ignition switches have uh, three modes: continuous, off, and auto. In the continuous position, the igniters are running all the time, and in the auto position, the igniters will only uh, come on uh, when specific parameters are met. Uh, then we have the fuel low level test, the fuel quantity test, the outer pump test, panel indicator light tests. There's multiple indicator light test switches all over the cockpit of this airplane. So it's not like most airplanes where there's one light, one, one switch that tests every enunciator light in the airplane. Um, there's actually four total test switches. So the panel indicator light test over here will only test um, these six enunciator lights across the bottom here. And they are the, this is the left beta range light, the right beta range light. These are the two ignition indicator lights here, to show you when the igniters are on. And these two over here are the outer tank empty lights that will come on when there's no fuel remaining in the outer tank and you're starting to burn out of that center main tank. Uh, stall warning test has an air and a ground position. The MU2 does not have a stall horn. It has a stick shaker similar to a jet. We have animated and implemented the stick shaker, and it will uh, come on. You'll hear it. You'll see it. It'll come on when you stall the aircraft, and uh, the test switch will function appropriately. So if you move the switch over to air while you're on the ground, nothing should happen. If you move it to ground while you're in the air, nothing should happen. So if you move it to the appropriate position for that stage of the flight, you'll get a stick shaker. Uh, and then the defog warning test, uh, which will light up an enunciator light when you actuate that switch. Just to the right of this is the prop sync. Uh, below that is the battery select switch, parallel or series, which basically just determines how you want the batteries to deliver power for the engine start, whether you want them lined up in parallel or lined up in series. And then just to the left of that down here is your fuel consumed counter, which will count in pounds how much fuel has been consumed. And uh, by moving this little safety lever here, you can move that and reset it back to zero, and it will start counting again from zero. Uh, Garmin GTN 750 from Flight 1. This is, as I said, the GTN 750 and the WX500 integrated model I'm showing you. And then we have uh, Collins, COM2, NAV2, and ADF. That also represents an aftermarket upgrade that uh, we've seen in some airplanes, as the, the Collins uh, radios over there. And then we have a fairly typical six-pack layout on the co-pilot side. Uh, your air conditioning and your bleed air controls are all down here on this panel. And your pressurization controls all over here uh, below the co-pilot's yoke. Moving up to the overhead panel, or before we get there, I'll show you this. This is the autopilot mode selector. Uh, lateral modes on the left, vertical modes on the right. So we have heading hold mode, nav hold mode, approach mode, back course, and VOR approach mode. And then we have altitude hold. Pressing that will just level the airplane off and maintain whatever altitude uh, you're at when you pressed it. Uh, altitude select is like, um, it's a primable mode, so you press that and it will uh, allow you to enable either vertical speed or airspeed hold to reach your d uh, demanded altitude in the altitude selector down here. Also an altitude alerter. And standby will test all of these light filaments. Uh, and also clear any modes that you have selected. Uh, we have uh, two more test buttons here. This button will test the fire handles. This button will test the annunciator panel down on the left. So I'll throw the battery on real quick and show that to you. And this is also the master caution light up here. Uh, the master caution light can be reset by just clicking it, push it in, resets it. So I'll show you left test button, that tests our fire pull handles, and then right test button, press and hold it down, lights up our enunciator panel down here. That test button I had talked about before, panel indicator light test, lights up all those enunciators down there. The standby button here, will light up only if the avionics is on, so let's turn on the avionics. So turning on the avionics and pressing standby will light up all of your uh, bulbs and everything inside the mode selector. 
And then there's another one way up on the overhead, and that will test right here. That'll test all of the light filaments on the overhead panel. Uh, quick note about the overhead panel. The switches do light up when they're on, so you can quickly identify which ones are on and which ones are off. And I know I mentioned a lot of custom sounds, so I'll show you really quickly right now. Um, the landing lights, when you flip them on, you'll hear the motor run, and you'll hear the landing lights come down, so we'll do that now. And now if we head outside, you can see that the uh, landing lights are extended and turned on. We'll go ahead and retract them. And uh, the beacon light, the airplane also has two rotating beacons. Uh, one is on the top of the tail, and the other one is actually right below the cockpit. And when the beacon is turned on, you can actually hear the beacon running. We implemented that as well, so I'll show you that. So you can see that. Uh, switches also have uh, all different switch clicks. So uh, lockout switches like this have a unique sound. These mini uh, switches have unique sounds. Uh, what else has unique sounds? The push button switches like the start fuel and rich. Uh, the flap gate. They have unique sounds. So there's a lot of unique click sounds I think you guys are really going to like. We'll go ahead and clear out this message real quick. And that test should, that test passes. TAWS system test. Okay. So that all fires up good. We'll put the radar in standby mode. Just get everything up to life here. Not too long, don't want to kill the battery. Uh, so that is the basic cockpit overview in the MU-2, and a basic overview of the aircraft. So the next video will be our engine startup video, and I'll walk you through that. And uh, we'll keep moving along through the videos. All right, everybody. From uh, Fly Somewhere Simulation Software, Joe, good talking with all of you. We'll see you next time. Fly safe.